check. Check, 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 check. Time. Go again, Brent. Check, check, check. More. I need more volume because it's either that or there's no wind today. We could see if it it picks up a little better without the cover. No, it's good. I'll, I'll turn it up more. Okay. Keep, keep talking. Check, check, check. Volume, volume, volume. Up, up, up. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Check, check, check. Check, 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 check. Does that pick up any better? Yeah, how does it sound back here? The problem yeah. is he's not hearing because he's behind the speakers. Okay. Check, check, check. It's good. Okay. Yeah, you're just not hearing it because you're so far behind the That's speakers. Fine. That's fine. As long as people can hear it, I'm, I'm good. No, 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 no. That's fine. Okay, so just checking which one of these is the correct speaker and hoping it's this one. It'll mess up my hair. What time is it? Six minutes away. Okay.
Diego. How are you? Oh, 
called for service. All the church is assembled for service. The deacons and the pastor are ready to greet. And what will the coffee hour have to eat? Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I got a beautiful feeling. What a joyful way to begin worship out on the lawn. It is good to see each of you here this morning. It is good to be with you. As I grow older and grow deeper in faith and community, there are a few guiding principles that continue to emerge for me about faith, even if in new ways. One is that all of this, creation, all of it around us, was and is still being made for the purposes of goodness and relationship. Another is this, that our faith, our journey, our way, our calling is an expansive one. Done well, it draws us beyond what we know. It calls us always to an even larger vision of God and beauty and love and freedom. Always to a bigger picture of who is welcome. Always a bigger picture of what freedom and choice mean. Always an expansive view of what abundant living is and how to see God's image out here in all this beauty and in every human being who is made in the image of God too. And finally, it is this, that this day is so critical to it all. This Sabbath day, a day set aside the linchpin to the commandments of loving God and loving neighbor too. This is a day, friends, in the shade of these trees to put down our burdens and our compulsions, to be with our God of goodness and relationship our God of expansiveness, our God who says enough is enough, come to me and find rest. Friends, at the end of this hard week, a week where a decision has left far more questions than answers, and far more division than connection, I am glad that you are here connected together. I am glad to be with you in the presence and in the arms of our loving God, the God of love, the God of hope, the God of grace, the God of possibility. Friends, it is time to worship. Come, let's remember who we are and to whom we belong. to worship. All heaven and earth proclaim the majesty of God's creative power. 
Praise God for the amazing and awesome beauty. God has given us codes by which to live together in harmony and peace. In these commandments, God has summed up the ways we must respect one another. Rejoice in the goodness of God. Praise God for God's sweet and steadfast love for us. to be in a place where there is no trouble, stress, loss, or worry. That peace does not mean that we know exactly where the road is going or how we are going to get to where we are called to be. But rather, it means to be in the midst of confusion and despair of worry and loss and everything else that life can throw at us and still have calm in our hearts. In that spirit, I say to you this morning, peace be with you. Now will you turn and will you give that peace away to everyone here and to all those at home as Patty swings the camera by. And when you have given away enough peace and found enough peace, you may be seated. For six days, for six days of the week, we work, we toil, we create, we consume, we make, we cook, we clean, we organize. For six days of the week, we claim our various roles in this world and in our homes and families. For six days of the week, we pay attention to everything the world throws at us. But on this seventh day, this holy day, this 
Sabbath day, we rest. On this day, we listen only to the author of love. On this day, we listen only to the sweet whisper of neighbor. On this day, we honor to remember who we are and to whom we belong. We set aside our compulsion to create that in the loving arms of God, we might be recreated. We cease making a name for ourselves that we might hear our name whispered in love. We give ourselves over to the one in whose image we are created and the one who calls us beloved. The one who invites us to new life in the waters of baptism and to new covenant and new community in the feast of the table. On this day, we gather here. Welcome. Welcome to Sabbath worship here at the First Congregational Church of the United Church of Christ in Stockbridge. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. This morning, in addition to all of you who are joined here on the lawn, I want to extend a welcome to Marilyn Strouch, to Joyce Hovey, to Pat LeBaw, to Christine Rasmussen, to Maurice Peterson, to Roger Damro, to Ray and Sangdow, to Jim Irwin, to Linda Colvin, to Jimmy and David, and to Claudia Cook, and to all the rest of you who are out there who may not have yet checked in. I will just say this. Last week you were jealous. Last week you were cold and shivering there in the shade while I had the warmth of the sun. I would switch places with you today. <laughs> but instead of that, let's bring the warmth of the children up here this morning for our kids' time. Come on up. It's a big book, isn't it? How many pages does it have? That's an excellent question. Let's see if it tells us. What's what? Well, we have to do addition because there's 288 pages in what we call the New Testament. And there is 1,054 in the Old Testament. So that gives us 1,342, I think. Okay, my math works out. So speaking of, that's exactly what I wanted to talk to you about this morning. Um, I wanted to ask you, are there books that you really love reading or is there is there a name of a book or a series that you really like what books do you like chapter books okay is there any particular one that you like a lot of them. good either of you have any books that you like reading you can't really read do you have books that you like having people read to you okay how about you jay The Pathfinder series. Yeah, a great series. You like Elephant and Piggy? Oh my goodness, they are so awesome. You know what the interesting thing about Elephant and Piggy is? I believe every book is 57 pages long. I think. I think every single one of them is. It's either 50, it's in the 50s, but I think it's 57. Yeah. Okay, it might be. So, today... We are talking about this book. It is probably one of the biggest books in the world. I don't know if it's actually the biggest. The dictionary might be bigger, who knows. Um, but this is actually a book of books. There's dozens of books in here, and there's one in particular I want to talk about. You talked about liking chapter books, right? There's a book in here called... Exactly that's why it says it. And how many chapters does it say is in there? 
151 chapters. 53. So this is 151. The book that we're talking about here, it's full of adventure. It's full of all kinds of things. It's full of stories of people loving. It's stories of people being afraid. It's stories of people being happy and angry and sad. Do you know what's even in it? People yelling. People yelling at God. People yelling at each other. It's a really great book. It's called The Psalms. And in the book, there are two main characters. One is God, and the other are the people. And did you know that that book of Psalms was written for somebody here? Did you know that? Do you know who? What's that? It was written for me. Do you know it was also written for somebody else? Yeah, it was written for Kathy. It was written for Sarah. It was. You were right. This book was written for everybody. The reason why this book, I think, is one of the most important in the whole Bible is it tells the story of what it's like to be a person living in this world. And a person trying to live in this world in God's way of love and peace and kindness. So today's service, we're looking at one of the 151 Psalms. It's number 19. And do you know what it talks about? It talks about how we learn about God. It talks about how we can learn about who God is. And you know what one of the ways it talks about? The first part of it talks about that we learn by listening. Listening to the trees, listening to the birds, listening to nature, listening to the world, looking at all of creation. Because in this, Psalm 19 says we can learn a lot about God. <laughs> the other way that we can learn about God, Psalm 19 says, is by learning this so well you might even know the whole thing by heart. Can you imagine? You might fall asleep trying to read it. Do you know there's people in this congregation who have read this book together and studied it from cover to cover? Do you know that? So here's what this psalm tells us. This psalm tells us both how to learn, that we should learn by looking at nature, that we should learn by reading this Bible. It also reminds us that we're supposed to keep learning our whole lives long. That the elephant and piggy books turn into chapter books, which turn into books like this. But just keep reading. Just keep learning. Just keep finding the joy of what it means to know more and more. It's one of the reasons that we keep coming to church. There are people who have been coming to church that are out here on this lawn for over 80 years. They keep coming. Because there's always more to learn. There's always more joy to be found. There's always more reasons to be happy and loving and honest too. Can you remember that? All right, here's what we're going to do. So we're going to say a prayer right now. It's a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. It's one that we practice every week, So not just so we learn the words, but that we learn new things through it each time. It's called the Lord's Prayer. If you know it, say it out loud. If not, we'll say it and we'll, we'll teach it to you. All right, let's pray. Our God, who art in heaven, our Lord, our Lord, all right you can head back to your seats now thanks for coming up Our reading today is Psalm 19. It is written for the director of music. It is attributed to David, the one for whom God establishes a covenant forever, the one to whose house Jesus would be born, the one so far from a perfect person brought into covenant with the perfection of God. Hear now these words. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. 
In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Here's what I know. It happens all the time. It happens with every breath and in each moment if we have but eyes to see and ears to hear. And it happened powerfully for me just a couple of days ago. There we were, our family, in this beautiful rustic house perched on top of a mountain in Vermont. Slowly, the clear skies gave way to clouds that enveloped that mountaintop retreat. Eventually, the far distant views of peaks and ridgelines gave way, and then eventually even houses and ski trails and power lines all disappeared, enveloping us in a closeness. There were the first gentle drops of life-giving rain that yielded to stronger torrents bouncing off the deck, resonating off the metal roof. For two days, my family had been in an area of Vermont, a town called Jamaica. We had noticed the shallowness of the rivers. We had noticed the desperate dryness of the soil. And so the rain was not only that wonderful invitation to rest that comes on vacations, right? But it also was a sign of life. It poured for more than an hour. It poured through dinner. It poured right up to and into Jake's bedtime. And then as we, both child and parents, settled into our different bedrooms with giant panoramic glass windows that looked west, suddenly the skies came to life in hue and in texture, gentle purples catching the final rays of sun, clouds exhausted of their rain, took on an interesting and unbelievable depth. A pattern I had never seen in a cloud before. You need to know that sunrises and sunsets are a phenomenon that I crave. I set aside time to watch them. My Sabbath experience is sitting out at the fire pit, waiting until the sun yields, until the last star has come out. I have never in my life seen a sunset like that one. And in the midst of this 19th Psalm, it hit me, a whole new creation. That sunset was more than the fleeting phenomenon that scientists would call scattering, more than simply molecules and small particles in the atmosphere changing the direction of light rays. But a new creation, a new invitation to relationship. It gave John and I a chance to come together, to linger in a relationship cognizant too of our greater relationship with God. For the truth of Psalm 19 declares that in that moment, like so many that we miss, the heavens were busy. They were busy declaring the glory of God, the works of creation, the goodness and relationship, as well as the newness of expansiveness. I don't know how many hundreds or thousands of sunrises and sunsets I've seen, but this new one was fresh. It was testifying, in my mind, to the work that God is still up to and committed to and inviting us once again into new creation with God. I don't know about you, but at the beginning of the pandemic, I heard so many stories about how creation spoke to people in new ways. I wonder if it was the weight of those moments when so much in the world seemed hard or whether we were simply forced to slow down enough to notice, to see 
and to hear. I remember those excited calls from Margot Davis out in New Marlboro about afternoons in her window seat, drawn out from her book time and time again to the beauty and grace of her surroundings. I remember she said, Brent, it literally speaks to me. And Psalm 19 would say, of course it does. It has been all your life. I'm glad you noticed. Do we have eyes to see and ears to hear? I heard from Elizabeth Young, who along her walks around the great, along the river in Great Barrington, with the world quieting down, how she would hear and see precious little birds. Do you remember what you saw, sang just a little bit ago? Each little flower that opens, each little bird that sings. She talked to me about how alive it made her in those moments and how she felt the promise of God, how outward those moments drew her, how able to face the difficulties of the pandemic it made her to be. And Psalm 19 would just smile and nod and say, yes, precious daughter, that bird may not be using words, and yet the voice goes out onto all the earth, eyes to see and ears to hear. I want you to take a moment right now, with no cars around, to look at this sanctuary. Take a moment and look up and around. Maybe Elizabeth has only been here six or seven times. Maybe some of you have been here thousands of times. And yet Psalm 19 makes it clear. There is stuff to learn of God by looking at this. That this is every much the sanctuary as that. Can you hear something? Can you see something? And I imagine that if you did catch a glimpse of something, it brought forth positivity and connection. I wonder if it brought forth wonder or love or all of the above. But I know that if you took the time enough to slow down and let this beautiful act of God's creation speak to you you found something good. These times are hard and heavy. They threaten fracture, they threaten separation, they, separ they threaten isolation in different but tangibly connected ways to the events of March 2020. I wonder if we can slow down enough to notice, to practice Sabbath enough to remember not just ourselves, but the glory of God, the one who creates for goodness and relationship, the one who sets before us moments of expansiveness, designed not just for a select few, but a warmth that arises and spreads until nothing is denied its gift. May we have eyes to see, ears to hear, and mouths to echo the glory of God on constant display out here in the March of Days. If we do, it will not make our current problems as a nature, nation or culture disappear, but it will root our lives in something bigger that transcends all of them. It will not necessarily bring us together as one, but it will bring each of us past our own limitations into the limitlessness of God's grace, mercy, and love in which all things, even unity, are possible. It will not give us the strength to change everything, but it will give us the courage to rest in the arms of the one who is always changing everything, starting with our own hearts, starting with our own minds, and starting with our own lives. Friends, in this moment, in this place, may you hear God speaking to you new creation right now. Amen.
19 finishes this way. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They're more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Do you remember what you saw when you gazed upon creation this morning? Do you remember how you felt? Do you remember a moment over the last few weeks when on a walk or gazing out your window that you saw something or heard something or smelled something that made you come alive? Maybe even start singing. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to be. How great thou art, how great thou art. It happened to me on a hike at Mohawk Trail State Forest. After a nearly vertical climb that left me breathless at moments, I crested the hill to see grand pine trees stretching out in the valley below me, to hear the sounds of bird call, to smell the sweet, dank forest floor, and in that moment, without a thought, I burst into song, singing how great thou art. And right there, Psalm 19 would have said, Amen. You should. Of course you should. You should all the time. I want you to think right now about the law of the Bible. I want you to think about commandments and teachings. I want you to think about Leviticus or Deuteronomy or Jesus saying, you have heard it said, love your friend, but I tell you to love your enemy. I want you to spend a moment letting all those laws, all those decrees, all those thou shalt and thou shalt not rise into your mind's eye. I don't know what came into your mind, but I'm less confident that when you think of the law, when you think of decrees, when you think of commandments, that you found quite as much positivity or connection as when you heard the sound of that bird. I worry sometimes that focus on things like law and commandment bring up feelings of inadequacy, fear or dread, or all of the above, more than wonder or love and Psalm 19 would whisper gently don't let it don't you dare let it instead in this reading that Sarah just did it said in the midst of all those laws and decrees find the refreshment of God's grace poured out for you find the joy of the way of life that Christ offers find the light of the Holy Spirit crackling in gentle warmth to drive the fear of isolation or shadow away Friends, this psalm, like all psalms, are full of truth. This psalm, like all psalms, are about goodness and relationship, about our relationship to God and one another. They draw us beyond decrees too small or too simple to imagine the stuff of God. And in this psalm, there is the beautiful both and. 
one that connects the innate kind of inspiration and growth that we find in the beauty of nature, the kind that radiates the same openness that comes from getting out there in those great spaces beyond ourselves, the kind that makes us want to sing out spontaneously to what we should find not just when we hiked to the top of Monument Mountain, but when we trove the depths of that great book right there, or when we trove the presence of the Spirit right here. Jake is eight. He is going on nine. He is in that stage of life where rules definitely chafe. When decisions that are not exactly what he wants them to be fall, feel burdensome, they are frustrating. They are hard. And I know he will grow out of that way of looking at some of these rules. I know eventually he will realize the beauty and possibility of what John and I are trying to offer him. How we don't give him that advice or make those decisions to take anything away from him. Or to make him smaller in any way. Not to have one more thing to live up to, but rather to discern and discover a life worth living into. Right now, my heart and my mind is in the Ridenauer Kalano household. Right now, on that hill up in Great Barrington, there is a beautiful, new, wonderful member of our church family, Ava Jewel Ridenauer, who burst onto the scene June 21st at 1.13 p.m. Here's what I know, is the very thing that's in scriptures, the very thing that's in law, the very thing that's in commandments is on full display in the way that that tiny little girl is held and beheld, in the ways she is cuddled and warmed, in the ways she is nourished and comforted with the new wonders Megan and Jeremy bring to her with every new breath. And everything is being done for her benefit, well, and Micah's too everything so that from the moment of her birth she might find goodness and relationship that she might grow into a life worth living and right now especially when something in life chafes when she cries out megan and jeremy rush to her to offer kindness and love and psalm 19 would say of course that's what those laws and decrees do every moment of the day I worry, though, that sometimes when it comes to our faith, that we never outgrow that chafing that Jake's in the middle of. That we never outgrow that when we hear words like law or commandment, that we want to shrink back rather than dive in. If you look at your bulletin, it's one of the reasons I left verses 11 to 13 originally out of the reading. In verses 11 to 13 in the Psalms are things like warning and fault and willful sins and transgressions. But the more I spent time with the psalm, I remembered the fullness of their truth, that we can trust them, and that they testify to God's grace. I worry sometimes that when it comes to our faith, we don't dive in, but we hold the Bible at arm's length. We take it all as representation, something out there or back there, as a depiction of something, and in some ways it is. But we know this, no matter how good a painting is, no matter how good a depiction of a landscape is, no matter how strong the artist's testimony is, it's not the same as being out there where it was painting. And so Psalm 19 says, get out there and see. Psalm 19 would say, breathe in all those laws and find the sweetness of honeycomb. Study this great book and you will find truth, the psalm says. Take what you learn from this book into the expansiveness of God's creation that together these teachings and these decrees do not become something for us to lord over one another as if we own religion, but an expansiveness to live into greater truth together. That these teachings and these decrees do not lead us to make definitions of who is in or who is out, but expand our vision to include all people as holding equal dignity, especially those that the world holds down. That together, these teachings, these decrees, do not tempt us to become masters of others, to take away the freedom of others, but rather like the Apostle Paul, willingly to become slaves, not of any human master, but only to the beauty of the fullness of God's creation. Psalm 19 commands us in times like this to hold on to both what is out there and what is in there. 
not to become better people, but to see and hear the glory of God and to break forth in song, to see and hear the glory of God, not to give up or give in to the enormity of the challenge, but instead to bask in the infiniteness and the vastness of God's love. Not to imagine we have ever arrived, but be like Paul, always open to transformation. And Psalm 19 says, of course, that's the way it's always been, just for people like you. In these times, may we be open to revelation, the kind out here and the kind in there. Not to be further weighed down, but instead to be offered the gift of refreshment, wisdom, joy, light, endurance, and sweetness, just like Psalm 19 proclaims the people of faith always have. That in these times, we may not look for headlines that bring down but rather to see the ongoing uplifting creation of God all around us and through it, keep for the sake of goodness, for the sake of relationship, for the chance of expansiveness. And you know what Psalm 19 would say? What are you waiting for? May the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts always be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So friends, we enter into a time of prayer. I share with you a prayer from David Anderegg for his kinsman, Manuel Moya, hovering between life and death in a hospital in Madrid. And I offer the prayers of many uh, for beautiful little Ava and for the Colano and Ragnauer family. And now I invite you into a moment of silence that you might bring the fullness of your life before the fullness of God. you invite us into prayer in all days and in all ways. In this moment, we open this time that people may name their prayers out loud, mindful that even if we do at the same time, you will hear and you will know them. God, listen to your people praying. we give you thanks for your revelation in creation we give you thanks for the gift of love we give you thanks for this next prayer we lift you all the needs of our hearts all of our fears and all of our joys knowing that you will hold them that you will honor them and that you will send them back to warmth here in your creation to give life and light to all loving God we know that you call us to be creators of this world that you have made and so now, friends, I invite you to join me in the unison prayer for creation printed on page three. Let us pray. Creator God, we make all things and weave them together in an intricate task for your love. 
Teach us to respect the fragile balance of life and to care for all the gifts of your creation. Guide by your wisdom those who have power and authority, that by the decisions they make, life may be cherished, and good and fruitful work may continue to show your glory and sing your praises. Almighty God, you have called us to tend and keep the garden of your creation. Give us wisdom and reverence for all the plants and animals who share your design with us and the lives in the hospital of our world. Help us to remember that they are the two who love the sweetness of life and join with us in giving you prayers. Amen. precious than gold, sweeter than honey. That is what Psalm 19 says about the way of life laid out in Scripture. May that guide you in your giving this morning. Giving to the ministries of this church and to the glory of God too. The offering will now be given and received.
love and life, bless these gifts and all who have gathered, that they and we may be a blessing, that they and we might offer refreshment, wisdom, joy, light, endurance, and sweetness to anyone and everyone in need. And let the whole church say, Amen. Friends, our time of worshiping God here in this sanctuary is coming to a close, that we might continue to worship God in all the ways of our life out there. A couple of invitations. If you are a member of this church, please stay for a very brief church, all church meeting to follow. We have some very important but simple business to take care of. If you are out at home and have not yet checked in, it would be very helpful for you to check in so that we know folks who are, the, who are here. We do have a quorum as of now. It would be really great to keep it that way. And so if you have not yet checked in at home, please do so, and Michael will make sure that he knows that you are here. And now, speaking of Michael, let me invite him up to give you the sending charge. Creator God, we listen as the heavens your presence. Lord, let your presence be in us, around us, breathing new life into us, so that we may do this work you have called us to do. Now, as we go forth, let the words of our, uh, the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Stick with me. God reigns, Emmanuel. 
God with us every day, in all our past and to the last, our comfort and our stay. Friends, I offer you a benediction today by Carlos Fernandez. He's the pastor of spiritual formation at the Village Church in Beaverton, Oregon. He has dedicated his life to ongoing learning and to becoming. Here's what he said, and here's the blessing he offers. As we return now to our homes, to our workplaces and communities, loving God, may your spirit open our eyes anew to the vastness and splendor of your beauty all around us. May we hear and smell and see and touch your glory in all of your creation. Above all, let us see your beauty, even in the brokenness of our brothers and sisters, all of them created in your image, and waiting to experience that redemption that comes only through Christ Jesus our Lord. Go now to love and to serve our Lord, and let the church say, Amen. Amen. congregational meeting this afternoon. We will also welcome the live streaming. I will call a quorum, which we almost have here, and we definitely have the live streaming. Um, there are two items to be considered today. Uh, a memorandum of understanding with the Waldorf School about conversations regarding Dr. Hall. Um, material, the Memorandum of Understanding, which might in the future be called an MOU, so that's what it is, um, was sent out last Sunday. There are copies there, along with a one-page background explanation from Pastor Brent. So, I will call the meeting to order. There is a quorum. Um, and we are here to act upon um, two orders of business. We will do this as we have most motions in the past several years by unanimous consent, which means that we will assume everybody is in favor of it unless they let us know they are not. And to do that, um, you would ask to be recognized here. And if you're home, call the number you call to check in and joys and concerns, which is 413-644-6435. And Michael will be manning that and let us know. And we'll give you a few minutes to do it, but you can object um, any time you want. So the first item is to authorize Kathy Clark. More. Uh, as moderator and on behalf of the church to sign a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, with the Waldorf, with the Berkshire Waldorf High School regarding the establishment of a six month, 180 day period of exclusive relationship during which we would explore the possibility of and the mechanisms for entering into partnership regarding the use of Proctor Hall as a school. Um, you want to say a few words, Brett? 
Um, so I will take a motion, and then it will be seconded, and then there will be an opportunity for discussion or questions. And then I will call the question. So again, if there are any no's, let us know. And then we will um, take a hand count or um, otherwise do it by unanimous consent. Is there um, a motion for the first order of business that I just read? Thank you, Frank. A second? Second. Thank you, Sarah. Um, is there any discussion um, or questions? And you can type in there. Mary? Mary Hoetzel asked, how do you ask me to repeat them? Um, what happened to the Norman Rockwell agreement? It simply expired. Um, so I, I touched base with Lori Dorton Moffat upon my return from sabbatical as just a routine call to check in with leaders of the community. The second memorandum of understanding that we had signed with the Rockwell Museum expired in early February, I believe February 5th. She and I discussed that it had expired. She discussed that the pandemic had changed some of their growth opportunities at the Rockwell. And we were made aware that simply it had expired. It was shortly thereafter that a representative from the Berkshire Waldorf School approached Bronley Boyd to ask questions about the existence of a memorandum of understanding. And it was at that point that we started entering into conversations with the Berkshire Waldorf School. But the, uh, the memorandum with, with uh, the Norman Rockwell Museum simply expired. Uh, they were aware of that, and at the time they uh, did not feel they were in a position to want to renew it. Well, I don't want to say they don't want to renew it, because they didn't make that clear, but they did not make uh, expression of in intent to renew, and subsequently we entered conversations with the Waldorf at their initiation. Thank you, Brent. Any other uh, questions or discussion on this? Anything, Mike, Michael, from our live streaming folks? Okay. Um, well, then I will call the question. Um, so, by unanimous consent, um, item A has been passed. Thank you. So, oh. So there's an opportunity to object. So are there any objections to the unanimous consent? Not on the law. Anything coming in? No, nothing. Is that okay? um, by unanimous consent, I call the um, item passed. So the second item um, is to appoint a task force to represent the congregation in that work. The task force would be Bronley Boyd, Kathy Clark, Brent Damero, Margaret Hornig, and Buck Smith. Is there a motion to appoint this task force? Patty, thank you. A second? Thank you, Diane. Um, okay, is there, are there any questions or discussion on this? Betsy? Um, Bet Which part, the task force or the memorandum? Whatever it's about, the task force. Okay, Betsy and Brian have asked for a quick outline on what this is about. So you have just approved a 180 day period for the church to enter into conversation with the Berkshire Waldorf High School regarding the use of Proctor Hall. This task force is the group of people who will be the initial conversation partners with the high school. They will bring back information for input and feedback from the larger conversation. If you remember the first time, for those of you who are here, that we entered into agreement with the Rockwell Museum, there were plenty of opportunities for input, for questions, for for conversation. 
this, this five-person task force is actually modeled after the five-person task force that worked with the Rockwell. Bronley Boyd is being suggested as someone who has worked on the issue of Proctor Hall ever since the town offices or the town hall left. So that is why he is there. The last group had Deb McBenemy on it in her role as moderator. So we are asking Kathy as moderator to be on it. It did include, for good or for bad, yours truly, and so I am once again, for good or for bad, being asked to be on the committee. The other two people, Margaret Hornick was on it as someone with great deal of wisdom and a great deal of experience with this church. And then finally, in the last one, there was a young man named Chris Kennedy, if you remember, on the, on the committee. He was on it as a person with architectural background to make sure that as those conversations went up, if there were any red flags or things to be asked, he could raise them. As many of you know, Buck Smith is a retired architect and according um, to Bronley, he eagerly and excitedly uh, took it upon it. Margaret Hornick was gonna take a red eye to be back with us today, but thought better of it and is still out in California. But that's the reason for those five people. And really what the five of us will be doing is simply meeting with representatives from the Waldorf School along with our attorney, Dennis Egan, who's been part of this all along and their attorney to make sure that the rights and interests of the church are being protected. And I can promise you that we will come back to the larger church for greater input as we go into any number of possibilities for how that partnership might unfold. And so those five people simply are the ones you are deputizing to have the conversations on behalf of the church with the Waldorf High School in trust that we will come back and share with you and communicate and take your input and your ideas. What we do with Proctor Hall is a very big thing in the life of this church. And you will be very involved in that decision making. I will tell you this. The Walter School is excited. They have funding lined up for it. They are interested and from the partnership we've observed already could make this part of town come alive in beautiful ways. That doesn't mean it's a done deal. There's a lot of work to be done between now and then. But we have this much shorter period to actually work with them in ongoing and concrete ways with all of your input too. Does that help, Betsy? Okay, Brian, good? All right. Any other questions? Mary or Ted? Can you remind us why we are talking about this as a church? I hope we do not own the building, is that correct, but the land under it? So Ted asked us to remind him why we're we holding this and regarding the ownership of the building. The Reader's Digest version is this. We entered into agreement with the town whereupon they leased uh, the right to have a building on that space, provided that it, always, that it served as the town hall for Stockbridge, which is why, by the way, that building down there is named Town Offices, if you'll notice. The attorney for the town of Stockbridge understands and maintains that the lease is still in effect between the church and the town. Right now, the town owns the building and the church owns the land. If the church were to revoke the lease, or if the town were to terminate the lease, it would all return to us. I will say this. We have been blessed that despite all of sometimes the stress in working with our town, they have honored their commitment not to foist upon the church a building that is woefully out of code and is currently of no use. They have upheld their bargain to at least keep that building there. If and when the lease would be terminated either by us or by the town, then at the conclusion of the lease, that land and everything upon it belongs to us, for good or for bad. So that's why, Ted, we are, we are engaged in this process of, of trying to discern a route forward with the Waldorf School. And we will share with you many of the approaches that our legal team is telling us and things that we have learned over the decade of working with them. Does that help? Okay. Any other questions or discussion on this item? 
Um, I will call the question, and we will assume it's by unanimous consent unless somebody raises their hand and objects or texts in. And this is just for the task force because we've already approved the memorandum of understanding. Um, there being no objection, the motion passes by unanimous consent. Um, I believe this is the end of our special congregation meeting. I'll turn this over to Brent. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. May the Lord give you grace and beauty and strength and hope and courage even in these times. Friends, go in peace now with joy into this wonderful world to love and to live. Amen? Amen. And now go get cold drink and food right over there. Thank you.